Hey everybody, uh, Scott Stevens here. We're going to have an interesting discussion. Uh, hopefully it's a two-way discussion on uh, something called time. It's a little unusual. It's not something that, uh, you know, let's just say we all live with it. We can't live without it or we can't get out of it. That's just not possible. But time is something that uh, we're born into and it's kind of my, my belief and my understanding that we only have so many breaths. We have only have so many days on this life. But there's been plenty of talk and certainly a lot of movies about can you get around it? Can you avoid your your time limits? Or is this even something that we can maybe jump in between timelines or time streams? And this has, is honestly, it has fascinated me for a long, long time. So let's kind of pop on in here and uh, we'll bring up a slide or two. Good to see you guys coming on here. Uh, Karen, always good to see your, your smiley face now and again. Uh, well, you know almost every day. So uh, we're going to talk about time. And uh, what I, so what I kind of want to know is, has this been a, a mission, a, a task, a, an ability that has been long ago accomplished, or is it a fantasy? And there's always a reason why you would want to keep something unattainable. For those who have attained it, then that would be telling and sharing and spilling your secrets. And so maybe telling somebody that you can do something is like showing them, you know, your hand of cards in the middle of a game. And with the way the world is these days, there would be great reasons to not tell someone if you can view across time, if you can see outcomes ahead of time. World War One or World War Two, basically, if we knew what the weather was going to be like on D-Day on June 6, 1944, then we would go ahead, we would plan, we would make a full on uh, a beach uh, assault on Omaha Beach and all those other uh, all those other beaches. There would mean be no concerns about it if you knew what the conditions would be like at uh, at, at landing time. Uh, same with same with the shuttle launch, maybe with an election outcome. If you could see who was going to win and the steps and things that you needed to do to get to that end, then you would go forward with gusto because there would be no risk. You would know the outcome, and then that would kind of set the game ahead of time. Yeah, who Doctor Who was a time traveler, uh, uh, Karen? Yes, yes, he was, and that was honestly a show that I honestly kind of enjoyed, so I need to play this thing. Otherwise, I'm going to be kind of locked out of this. So here we go. Uh, long ago accomplished or fantasy. Let's get through there. And this is just kind of the open. I think this topic, time travel, is, is in a way it's completely out of my league. Yet it endlessly fascinates me. I imagine that the concept of time travel began the moment after someone uttered the statement, I wish I would have. Or I sure would have liked to have been there for that. And these could be very small family-related experiences or something much, much bigger like the death of a loved one or a, a global disaster that you would like to have warned other people, people about. You know, this, these two statements, I wish I would have or I would like to have been there for that, kind of cover many of the reasons that people have regrets. I wish I would have. So, uh, or are we just expressing some kind of regret that one's behavior could or would be different if given a second chance? Certainly the intelligence agencies and the military would like the capability to see across time because it makes the fog of war so much less uncertain. Then there's, this, then there's simply the entertainment value of having been there. For whatever great event in history one might want to visit out of time. You were born in 1966, but yet to get you get to see Hitler give a speech. You get to go see Cleopatra. You get to go see one of Shakespeare's plays. It's like the world becomes a playground if that was a possibility, if you could do these things. So are these just considerations of what if? It's already been done, or what are the ramifications if this is already a perfected technology? What if? So, how's your time machine coming along? Uh, not very well, I'm afraid. Well, I've invented the first waste of a time machine, and then they sit down and enjoy some TV. So, when one is watching the the classifieds, I guess I suppose today it would be the. Uh, it would be the Craigslist if you're looking for ads. So this one simply stated, wanted someone to go back in time with me. This is not a joke. And then there's the P.O. Box address, Prince George, British Columbia, zip code. And of course, 
And of course, you'll get paid after we get back, and you must, of course, bring your own weapon. Safety is not guaranteed, and I've only done this once before. But you've got to have someone to go through time with. So, as, as Vicky mentioned over here just a moment ago, yeah, 1942, the Philadelphia Experiment or something like that. I can't say this was my first uh, experience with, with a time-based movie, but maybe it was. I was just a, a freshman at college, and I remember the evening where we went out to Lawrence, Kansas and went down to the theaters and, and, and watched the show, and it intrigued me. It really, really did, because there was some depth and some detail in the story that seemed kind of legit and, and in many, many ways seemed believable because the outcome was not fa a fairy tale. It was, for those who participated, a little scary, and death met some of their, uh, their, their outcomes because it was an experiment. It wasn't a process that had been perfected. And so it was a uh, U.S. Navy destroyer escorts. Escort participates in a Navy invisibility experiment that inadvertently sends two sailors 40 years into the future. And I have to tell you, I've had a conversation with one of those two sailors. It's been a few years, but I've had a talk with one of these guys. So 42 best time travel TV series. You know, there's 42 of them. So this is not a topic that is just, you know, that's made Hollywood some money. Doctor Who at the top of the list. Dark, which is ongoing on Netflix, I believe, right now. And I we're, I think we're, we just finished uh, season two. Erased. Uh, Dick Gently, Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. Devs. Doctor Who. And we're pretty familiar with Doctor Two simply because of how long running it's been. Life on Mars, and I don't want to say everybody's seen Lost, but a lot of us have seen Lost. Quantum Leap was a few years before that from 1989 to 93. Dark Shadows, Russian Doll on presently. Terminator, Terminator, where the guy drops out of a portal, boom, and in. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, that Terminator storyline has shown up in some of the time viewing folks that have come back with pictures, with descriptions of potential timelines. And it's a little scary because we end up with robots. We end up with with um, a dystopian type of future. Uh, the Twelve Monkeys, the day Kennedy died, 11, 22, 63, and so forth and so on. Travelers, Torchwood, uh, Tales from the Loop, Umbrella Academy, also on presently. Odyssey 5, Alcatraz, uh, Time Travel. So, you know, this is not an unfamiliar topic. So let's throw this in there. From Ben Rich, the second director of Lockheed's Skunk Works, and this he stated in 1993, so almost 30 years ago, we already have the means to travel among the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black projects, and it would take an act of God if we were to ever get them out to benefit humanity. Anything you can imagine, we already know how to do. And there was another statement where this gentleman stated, we not only know E.T., but we can take them home. So distance is not an issue. So how would you travel light years if not for the ability to manipulate time? And there have been many others who have come forth from this vein, basically uh, stating that a lot of the greys and a lot of these fee people people that we, we encounter and, and are continuing to encounter are not necessarily from out there, but from here, but inside and from a different time. So time traveling is in, in many ways better than the ability to travel distance, although to do the one across time, you need to do and can do uh, the others. <clears throat> so as we begin to bring this out of Hollywood, look at what the military industrial complex can apparently do, then we have that 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 push of information, those whistleblowers that begin to bring this topic into the consciousness of humanity. And Hollywood is doing their, their piece because almost at any given time, there is some series, some movie playing somewhere discussing this topic. So from Wikipedia, which is always takes, uh, usually takes the contrarian point of view, the one that does not take anything hook, like and sink, or we're going to stand off. It's, it's curious, the editing that happens with Wikipedia. It's really, really curious. That is a whole nother show all by itself is that entities and those entities which are behind Wikipedia. But there have been various accounts of people who allegedly traveled through time, reported by the press, or circulated on the internet. These reports have generally turned out to be either 
quote unquote hoaxes, or to be based on incorrect assumptions, incomplete information, or interpretation of fiction as fact. Many now being recognized, of course, as urban legends. And then here's the list. Here's the list, and it goes on. And so, a mobile device in 1943, present day hipster to 1941 bridge opening, Charlie Chaplin's uh, time traveler, and, and list. This is this is a cool, cool rabbit hole if you really wanted to get down. And then we have photographic evidence because why go back in time if you can't retrieve, bring back with you, show evidence of your arrival and participation within the events that you have gone to see. So Greta, being a time traveler, sent to save us from ourselves, is the only conspiracy that I want to hear about. As the New York Times posted this 120-year-old photograph of a, uh, is, sparkling Greta Gun is sparking Greta Thunberg's conspiracy theories. It sure kind of looks like the chap, um, the, the gal, but there's also the concept that we own our face. We take our face with us. You're born with it, and you carry it through time. You know, wh whatever parents you are, the soul, the expression that is your your beingness comes through that face. So as we begin to scour through old photographs, testimonies of whistleblowers, and so forth and so on, we begin to see uh, unusual technology in the hands of passerbys, folks that uh, should not have a cell phone. Really, in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and there are not just a few of these pictures. But what would what would this device be? And my question is, why would you use one of these if the network is not in place to pick up your call or someone else to call to? So I have to, you know, I'm kind of kind of curious about that one. And then there's this gal. She is in a striking number of photographs in very curious situations. But even for me, there's always somebody on the other side to take her picture inside the situation. So it's almost as if you need to go as a team to help one another out through situations that might get a little bit sticky. You might need to have a friend or a husband on your arm to get into situations or just to introduce yourselves, not as a single person, in these kind of parties and gatherings. Another situation where we're, where we're back in time prior to where we would see a digital phone and, and curious haircuts, curious attire. And if this is a rabbit hole you'd like to go down, uh, please dedicate a Saturday at least to it because there's plenty of photographs where you can see person after person after person. Numerous past American presidents also photographed in these out-of-time situations. Vladimir Putin, 1920, that sure looks like the guy. You know, and 1941, only 20 years difference. And it doesn't look like he's aged quite enough to be the same person. And then, of course, in the uh, in the early 2010s. So, again, we take our face with us. Now, this is a little article by Andrew Zimmerman Jones, and it, it was a rather long article. So he just pulled out uh, two paragraphs from it to you know describe time. Time is certainly a very complex topic in physics. And there are people who believe that time does not actually exist. One common argument they use is that Einstein proved that everything is relative, so time is irrelevant. In the best-selling book, The Secret, the authors say time is just an illusion. Is this really true? Is time just a figment of our imagination? Among physicists, there is no real doubt that time really, truly exists. It is measurable, unobservable phenomena. Physicists are just divided a bit on what causes its existence and what it means to say that it exists seems like a difficult uh, point uh, indeed this question borders on the realm of metaphysics and ontology the philosophy of existence as much as it does on the strictly empirical questions about time that physics is well equipped to address so all right now i gotta change screens here because this is a reminder project pegasus was the classified defense related research and development program under the defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. If you've heard of DARPA, raise your hand. In which the U.S. defense technical community achieved time travel on behalf of the United States government, the real Philadelphia experiment. Uh, experiment. This is the Project Pegasus mission statement. So what we have here, and I need to escape out of this because I need to head over to this other content because this is a rather art long article and I didn't want to leave it behind. And this goes into... Uh, 
time travel and teleportation experience experiences. Because uh, Andrew Basaggio, he came out. He was a whistleblower. He was an attorney. So uh, in 2004, 2004, Washington-based attorney uh, Andrew Basaggio was telling his story of top-secret organization called Project Pegasus. Although he was only seven years old at the time, Basaggio claims he had, from 1968 to 72, participated in a number of bizarre experiments that took him on journeys through time, space, and potentially most likely into parallel universes. The mission of Pegasus was to study the effects of time travel on and teleportation on children, as well as to relay important information about past and future events to U.S. presidents, the intelligence agencies, community, and the military. The project, or so the story goes, involved a total of 140 children who would go on be- to become America's first generation of chrononauts time explorers. According to Passaggio, children were recruited specifically for their ability to adapt to the strains of moving between past, present, and future. What is amazing is that he said that they used children because they were objective. They could watch, view a scene without the prejudices of adults. This is why they chose children of that age, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, not much older than ten, because they would need to be in the program long enough. So they used children because of their ability or their greater ability to be unbiased observers. They hadn't become judgmental about what they were viewing. So while Basaggio claims there were several time-traveling devices at work during these experiences, the majority of his temporal adventures can be attributed to good old Nikola Tesla. Documents allegedly retrieved from New York City apartment after his death in January 1943 revealed the schematics for teleportation machine using something Basaggio calls radiant energy. The machine would form a shimmering curtain between two elliptical elliptical booms. Passing through this curtain of energy, Basaggio would enter a virtual tunnel, excuse me, a vortal spiral, a vortal tunnel that would send him to his destination. The other teleportation device included plasma confinement chamber in New Jersey and then a jump room in El Segundo, California. There's also another one that I, someone else had mentioned was in northern New Mexico. And this is one of the reasons why the Department of Energy is the Department of Energy, because they're using that agency as part of the tools, because they would have access to great sources of energy in research situations to power these kind of devices, this kind of technology. There was also some kind of holographic technology which allowed them to travel both physically and virtually. The virtual thing is a curious thing because that takes us into a device. And I've got pictures here in a moment where you can then, because it's quantum and you are a quantum being as well, you will view something, even if it's the same thing. If, if your target is July 20, 1969, and five people are given that particular date at a particular time and at a particular location, you will pop in, you will view that scene, but with your own eyes. And so would four other witnesses see the same thing. So part of what they're doing is creating enough of a viewing audience to get a fair assessment of what is happening in that particular point of time. Yeah, talk about a reality show. Isn't that the truth? And to me, that it, it, it excites me. This would kind of be kind of be crazy. But then how do you share this? Who do you get to share this with? Your childhood becomes a non-disclosure agreement. And for how many years can you not share the stories and the experiences that you've taken that are so out of out of normal or out of out of bounds for what your other peers uh, would participate? So they weren't always safe, though. According to the Huffington Post, one of Asagio's cohorts, Alfred Weber, recalls one instance where a child returned from his temporal voyage before his legs. As he puts it, he was writhing in pain with jump with with just stumps where his legs had been. These bugs, according to Weber, had been ironed out in the 40 years or so since these experiments began. As for his own trips, Passaggio described traveling through the vortal tunnels as a rough and turbulent experience. And that's really the way, you know, D- uh, Deep Space Nine, uh, Stargate, all of those use that kind of shimmering curtain as they walk through a circular portal and end up on on somewhere else. One of the other things that Passaggio did was he... Uh, 
Several of his voyages led him to the 1800s. On one occasion, he found himself at Gettysburg on November 13, 1863, where President Lincoln gave his famous address. And this was him in boots that were far too large for his young feet. And, and, and it, it, it's interesting because you can, you know, they send these people back. They, the, the powers that be know they were there. And so they can come back, look through history and see if their interjection into the timeline manifests down the timeline in the evidence of, uh, of the photographs and other physical uh, experiences, other physical evidence of that uh, event in time. So as Basaggio tells the story, he was dressed up as a Union bugle boy. However, he felt that his oversized shoes were drawing too much attention. So he wandered away from the crowd only to be photographed, as you can see. And he goes into the more, uh, this author goes into more detail. But Basaggio also traveled to the Ford Theater, even on the evening of Lincoln's assassination. In fact, he did so multiple times, even running to himself twice even though he never actually witnessed the assassination. Interesting that you could run into yourself, but at least you would have the awareness to recognize it. And the others probably, too, that you're all on the same mission. But if you were to see two or three of yourselves in a situation, you would realize that, okay, some, something is not right. We need to, to regroup and, and figure out how to accomplish the mission, accomplish the, the data. So he also said they went to Mars and they had jump rooms to Mars. And uh, I think it was uh, God, Richard Hoagland talked about the face on Mars actually being the location upon which uh, Earthlings would go through the wormhole, the jump rooms, and then literally within seconds end up on Mars and there to have their experience. So who needs spaceships? Who needs chemically powered SpaceX to get there when you've got this other technology? There's a public space program, and then there is everything else. In the 1980s, while working under Project Pegasus, he utilized the aforementioned jump room to teleport to the Red Planet with the express mission of acting as an ambassador to the Martian civilization. His fellow travelers, William Stillings and President Obama, among others, during his ex escapades to the Red Planet, Basaggio claims he encountered many extraordinary things, not the least of which were towering dinosaurs, which he described as humanoid scorpion men. In fact, according to Basaggio, the roaming Martian dinosaurs were known to devour any humans who found themselves lost on the planet's surface. Indeed, to hear, hear Basaggio tell it, Project Pegasus revealed Mars as an extraordinary and dangerous place. There are other whistleblowers where I've heard this too. The Mars is extraordinarily dangerous and because water is so, so precious, so rare that nearly all life is underground. There, there just is no risk of, of having that water evaporate or sublimate into the atmosphere. It's all held very, very, very tightly underground. So and very quickly, because of, of, of that thing called time, we have uh, NASA's image taken by the Curiosity rover on June 7, 2013. And what does this look like to you? They spotted an anomaly in 2015 pointing out the nostril area of what seems to be rows of teeth. And here, of course, let me circle that to you. And because it's so dry, there's so little rotting, degradation, things nearly fossilize at a very, very rapid pace because there's so little moisture and temperature, so cold on Earth. This is not the only photograph. I remember uh, 2003, 2004, where I was just a fanatic looking at uh, the, the rovers and photographs that were released out. I got a library somewhere uh, of these fascinating anomalies and then even just what looks like a vertebrae of another another beast, another animal, a large, large animal on the, on the surface of, of Mars. So that's kind of uh, where we are with that. I could go into the other timelines, but this, let's pop back up here and finish this baby because it's really kind of cool. Um, so Pegasus studies time travel and then the chronoscope. This is kind of where it began. It was invented by Frank Friedman at Oppenheimer. Uh, these were his birth and death dates, uh, 1912 to 1995. So the chronoscope is based on the theory that every light particle or every photon is unique. It has a soul. It has a, what you might call a time stamp that will exist eternally. In other words, light particles are identifiable because each particle has a unique key. And that unique key relates to a certain point in time. It has an imprint. By grouping, sorting, and filtering on certain time, a certain time period, it's possible to view that certain time period. Frank Oppenheimer devised a so-called Oppenheimer time equation, which allowed him to put the theory into practice by creating the chronoscope. In contradiction to what some people might think, the chronoscope is not a time machine, 
but it is a time viewer. Of course, it's certainly possible to look in the past, although some experiments have given indication that looking into the future is also possible. He was working on a revision of his time equation that included future possibilities, and then his death in 95 halted the research into his uh, into part of the future. But as then as you open it, you can see in, and this was the quantum aspect with the different viewers, the different people seeing different scenes, the same scene, but still with a unique point of view. And the Vatican has been interested in this as well. Hugely interested in this. The chronovisor was invented by the Vatican priest, Father Pergelio Ernetti, uh, 1925 to 44. So similar death date principle is more or less the same as the chronoscope. That sights and sounds of the past will never disappear. They will float around forever. Yet there's still no scientific theory that will prove the principle. And he's not been able to find more detail uh, about that theory that would back it up. Now, I would bet that we have Lockheed Martin and we have these deep state technologies that can see these things. And then the Catholic Church, if you want to look this up, was eventually the funder. And still, with another lens, we've got another curiously shaped device. And I don't know the wrenches and how you would angle it. And maybe you pop in and then it kind of creates this little opening through, uh, through the dimensional to then kind of peer in to the other reality that you're trying to pierce through through. What is interesting is that through that device, as crude as it was, they were able to look at the crucifixion of Jesus and afterwards. And this was a photograph that they took in the 1990s of this particular event. So that may be a photograph of what the body of Christ then looks like. So we uh, pop a little forward and uh, look at kind of some of the time travel, because if, if you look at YouTube, there are probably a dozen folks right now claiming to be time travelers, all bringing back their, uh, di different stories and different um, evidences of their time travel. They all kind of paint a little bit of a dark future of what lies ahead for humanity. Uh, and I, There are others that uh, will see a different outcome, but that would absolutely engender an intervention of some grand and probably divine form. So travel, time travel at its best is unsound. Having said that, it is not uncommon. This and actually just was posted two or three days ago. Not only have there been humans and others who have made the journey, but basic quantum particles make the leap on a regular basis and seem to float around between past, present, and future according to their own nature. And again, remember, language cannot capture this phenomena in a meaningful manner. It can only provide an imperfect glimpse, much like looking through these devices. You're all going to see something slightly different. Scientists tell us that most of the universe is made of matter and energy they define as dark. It is dark because it exists in the past and the future. We see its footprints, but not its essence. What I have found is that to journey into the past creates its own strangeness. For example, Hitler was assassinated three times in 1938. Each assassination was overturned by a higher power, which prevented this timeline from being changed. On the other hand, several events were changed if they did not affect the timeline, much the way a river would find inconsequential whether a rock was placed in place A or B. Visiting the future takes you to a realm of existence that is well terrifying. You will see things and participate in events that can truly make you insane. You're like, what is real and what is not? In the future, you see the hand of God. Such is seeing the destruction of the Three Gorges Dam. Knowing this is going to happen and that it's part of the plan means your role in the universe is very limited, yet in a way is releasing. The ability to control a timeline has always been, to me, the ultimate proof of a higher power. Next, a family who has two members who have strolled in time on a journey. Say hello to my gatekeeper. I will introduce him soon. Quite the young man. He has quite the past and quite, uh, quite the future in the past. Interesting that you can look at time in that kind of a way. So in, in my teachings, what I've come across and decided were, were kind of the highest of what was going on. Uh, my teacher refers to it as the messed worlds, matter, energy, space, and time. Matter is where we are, physical, physical matter. Energy is, resides or at least can get as low as, as the astral realm, and that is powered with emotion, powered with desire. Space is the mental realm. And then time provides the gap between moments. 
So that time is on top. That creates the separation, creates the ego, separates us from a unity, which would then reside the next layer above in formlessness where soul and consciousness and God reside. So that would be the task, is to take that consciousness and get it back up to that higher end. All right, and the bartender says, because we're going to end this with just a bit of a joke, I'm sorry we don't serve time travelers here. And then the time traveler walks into the bar. And of course gets the drink. All right, so this this is kind of a topic that I, I really kind of find fascinating, and uh, apparently Hollywood does too. There has to be some truth in it. Uh, the one thing I didn't even touch on, The Simpsons. The Simpsons. Look at how many events are depicted in The Simpsons that are become, well, true or real in this reality. So there's something that Matt Groening has access to, has had shared with him that he has chosen years ahead of time to write into storylines between Bart and, and Homer and Lisa and Marge and on and on and on. Storyline after storyline after storyline. We could have done this whole 30 minutes on simply The Simpsons, the times that uh, The Simpsons have predicted, shared with us ahead of time, what eventually would come to pass. All right, guys, uh, astral travel is time travel. It can certainly take you into that realm, which is so, so much larger than the physical. Yes, uh, I did see that, Vicki, uh, 2039. And so do you have to go to the future to take that picture and then bring it back? You see, and that's why the, the previous person said it could truly make you crazy trying to figure out where and when things happen and then trying to keep it all straight. It, it's, it's ridiculous. And uh, Robert, if we could look into the past, it makes sense. We could obviously look into the future. And uh, there's the uh, uh, Michael J. Fox Back to the Future movie as well. And there are interesting 9-11 drops that have happened and they, they shared in that particular movie. So there was, there was some foreknowledge of those kind of events as well. Uh, it, 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 it's crazy. Time travel is everywhere through Hollywood if we kind of kind of look. And karmically, they'll tell us it's happening. They won't admit it's happening. And that's our work to do on our own is to figure that out. Yeah, topic, uh, topics for Star Trek shows. I, I, I agree. I w became a huge Next Generation fan. Not, not so much the early, to uh, early, early Star Treks. That came a little bit later on after I drew. I, I appreciated and got to, yeah, I got my appreciation for Star Trek. Then I could look at the old stuff and, and not uh, poo-poo the special effects. But the storylines is what you have to fall in love with. All right, guys, uh, thanks for stopping by. How is it that the powers be remain in power? <sighs> this probably is a tool that they have used. And the only way that they would be, would, would lose power is if a higher power could come in and then, peel away or change a timeline that they do not have the ability to see into. Because if you couldn't see that future, if you couldn't see that outcome, then the tools that they have couldn't anticipate, prepare for, prevent, or avoid. And that's how I think that's all going to be dealt with, is that it has to be a higher power. Otherwise, all of the stuff I've seen the, these people coming back from the future, the future for humanity is not a terribly pretty one. And in, in this slide here, this, this particular viewer talks about uh, basically what happens with the Three Gorges Dam. When that goes, we'll have some earthquakes around Western China, and then there'll be a pause, and then the big one will strike. And when that happens, then it all begins and gets kind of gets kind of freaky out there. So we're going to look for that to see if it happens in the next uh uh, next couple of weeks, if this guy's on 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 mission, all right. Hey, thanks for stopping by. I love to see your uh, your your questions and your comments. Uh, and of course, if you're watching the replay, then hit hashtag replay, and we can we can reply to your your comments and questions. Yeah, Robin, it is fascinating. You know, it's a little little science geeky in me that really enjoys these kind of topics. All right, have a great night, guys. And uh, we do the weather show uh, every five o'clock Mountain, and these shows on Monday and Wednesday. If there's something you'd like for us to hit or talk about, hey, throw it in the comments as well, and we'll see if we can't get those addressed. Because hey, it's a strange world out there, and I have a feeling it's going to get a whole lot stranger. So let's go through it together. All right, have a great night, guys. Hey.